So some of you know me, some of you don't. And I know most of you, I think I've seen, some of us have got a lot grayer and <laughs> older. Wiser. <laughs> I'm hoping wiser. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the life has been brutal, but pretty wonderful as far as it comes to Christ working. So anyway, my name is Blaine Robison. And... Uh, this meeting comes to be because Glenn came over to do something in my shop and then I shared some things with him. He's like, why don't I have my thing to record you? Every time I talk, I need to have, what, how can we get together and you can share this stuff? And I said, you know, just do whatever you can do and, and I'll come and share what I have. So, um, there's a lot of information to cover. I, I'm going to try and recap where we've been and what's going on and then Kenny will take a little piece and we'll go to where we are now and what's happening with the message. So I'm going to ask a question and then we're going to kneel down and have prayer and then at the end it, when I get done talking if you remind me I'll give you the answer to that question. The Lord gave it to me this morning and I've been asked, asked this question a multitude of times and I know you have too. Not usually in a very nice manner, but... So anyway, the question is, where is Christ in your message? Has anybody ever heard that? Where is Christ in your message? So, why don't we kneel, if we can, and uh, we'll ask the Lord to bless His information. Father in heaven, you've gathered your people together on the Sabbath to look at a message that has been given, designed to purify, make white, and try. And Lord, there's a lot of information here, and without the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that third dignitary of the Godhead, the one who would possess us, and teach us those things, the great things of God. Lord, without Him, we can do or understand nothing. And so we're asking, Lord, that you would intervene in our behalf here, that angels that excel in strength would come and be present in this building, that those wicked and evil angels would be driven from this place, that we might have our minds open to your understanding. And please, Lord, this is about you, not me. This is about what you've been teaching me. This is about a testimony that is my life that involves these truths. So please, Lord, speak. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to recap some things that we should know. We should have gone through, and, but it's going to come in a little bit different way. And uh, so it won't be completely boring. And for those, some of you don't know anything about any of this stuff. But interestingly enough, um, we're all going to pass through this experience one way or the other. And some of the information I read later on will tell you how and why that happens. So, I'm going to start with I'm just going to be sharing some quotes. And I'm going to, let me open God's word first. And I'm just going to have a prayer here as I do that. Father in heaven, I don't want to carelessly go into your word. So I ask for uh, the carefulness, the meekness and lowliness that only you can give in approaching the throne of grace as you've written and given us this, these things in your word. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Habakkuk 2, 1 to 4. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I am reproved or in the little column it says argued with. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision 
and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. So what I'm going to share with you comes from this. It's a foundational issue for a Seventh-day Adventist. These charts, if you have them up and you're talking to your Heavenly Father about the information that's on them in the prophetic understanding, it will speak and it will not lie. That is proof, scripture, and we're at the end. I don't know if anybody of you have noticed, but we're out of time. Something has to happen with God's people or we're all going to fry. So somebody better stand back on their foundation and they better understand how to stand on it. And they better see what's happening there. So let them speak and not lie to you. So it says, they will see, not, but it says, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. It says, at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Faith in what? Faith that God's word is the truth. Faith that what he's given us is for us at the end of time. Faith that we're going to be able to meet our creator in peace without sin. Okay, so let's verify these things a little bit by the spirit of prophecy. I want you to pay close attention to some dates because some things happen in these dates. And I just learned this. Most of, a lot of the things, I've known this information and always what happens when I'm about to share, which I haven't for a long, long time, is I start to get answers to things that I never knew. So this is November 1st, 1850. November 1st, 1850. Monday, we return to Georgechester, where our dear brother Nichols and family live. There in the night, God gave me a very interesting vision, the most of which you will see in the paper. God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw it was needed and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to a knowledge of the truth. What truth? Christ. What does Christ say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me, by me. So the truth. When the truth comes up and it's said that we're given the truth, you got a decision to make. Either it, God's word and the spirit of prophecy are truth, or they're a huge lie. Catastrophic. So the determination you have to make is, am I going to go find whether this is truth or not? So it says, so you get, she's, she's verifying the truth made plain upon tables. We need a chart in 1850, November 1st. Okay, this is November 7th. Now she's getting different views and different things are happening. So listen, I saw that the truth, Christ, should be made plain on tables that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's, and that necessary means should be not be spared in making it plain. I saw that the angels' messages made plain would have an effect. I saw that the old chart was directed by the Lord. So what is she doing here? This is a different view now, and she's verifying this chart. That's what she's doing. Says, I saw that the old chart was directed by the Lord, and that not a peg or a not a peg of it should be altered without inspiration. Now something's going to happen really soon here, because in a few weeks she's going to get another view, and there's going to be another chart. So who's getting the variables about inspiration? Is God giving her then the inspiration to for, to make the corrections? Yeah. yeah so it says. That pin or peg should be removed without inspiration. I saw that the figures on the chart were as God wanted them, and his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. Okay? Now, some people say, well, it's a 2520 that was a mistake. And, you know, but we know, because if you look at the 1850 chart, 
understood correctly, you will realize that there's only one thing changed, a little number there that happens to be here and here and here and here. She was given the inspiration, 1844, October 22nd, 1844. So, letter 28, 1850, November 27th. So this is a couple weeks later. On our return to Brothers Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables, and it would cause many to decide for the truth. For who? Truth. For Christ. For truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. By the, th by the three angels' messages, with the two being on, made plain upon tables. What did you just say? Let's look at it again. It would cause many to decide for the truth by the three angels' messages with the two former being made plain upon tables. So you have two being made plain on tables, and you have a third angel's message. So what you hear and see here is three angels' messages. Now listen. <clears throat> In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists, and this is 90, 19, first and second paragraph. Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. No other work. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Nothing. I don't know what part of nothing most of us don't get, but I think a lot of us don't get the nothing part. It's like, ugh. the most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given us to proclaim to the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. What are we proclaiming here? What is it? It's something about Daniel and Revelation, is it not? These are the truths that come from God's word, the prophetic understanding of Daniel and Revelation. Okay. Of course, it's not to be a pin or pig moved from them things either. So. This also comes up. We know this too. This is 1EGWLM246.8. Then I saw, and this is of course in early writings, page 74, the daily that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the first angel's message. Well, we're told that the first angel's message is an unpopular message. Guess what? That's the message we're supposed to be given as Seventh-day Adventists, and in popular. But the correct view of the daily is given to those who give that message. Are you giving that message? Do you understand the correct view of the daily? Well, if you read the chart that speaks and doesn't lie, it says, pagan dominion or the daily taken away. Daniel 11, 31, 508, and the papacy set up, 538. One desolating power taken away, Another one put in its place. Same stuff. It's the daily. There's the explanation of it. The simple one. The one that is the truth that doesn't lie. No, they need to get caught up in it. You will find... Oh, I'll go to that later. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of stuff here. 13 MR 359. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brothers Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible, and if this chart is designed for God's people, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another, and if one needed it, a new chart painted on a larger scale, all needed just as much. She's verifying. Okay, 13 MR 359 and MS 1, 1853, paragraph 19. I saw that the charts ordered by God, these charts are the ones ordered by God, struck the mind favorably, even without an explanation. Huh. 
There is something light, lovely, and heavenly in the representation of the angels on the charts. The mind is almost imperceptibly led to God in heaven. Now I'm asking myself, Lord, what, really? Is that what's happening here? I've had these things hanging on my wall for years. In my bedroom, little tiny thing, and they're just right in my face all the time. There's something draws. I get myself reading stuff on there, and they speak. All of a sudden, the Lord's saying, did you notice this? And I'll share something with you that I noticed after years and years of looking at them that I never ever saw. It's important to all of us. Okay. So, Manuscript Release 15, page 317, and Letter 78, 1905. Temptations are being brought in by men who have been long in the truth. The truths that we received in 1841, 42, 43, and 44 are now to be studied and proclaimed. When was this? 1905. With a loud voice, they will be given with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit. January, Review and Herald, January 19th, 1905, paragraph 22. We have, as had John, a message to bear of the things which we have seen and heard. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the messages that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. We need the zeal and earnestness that were then seen among God's people. Some of us are getting worn out, and our zeal and earnestness isn't so good. And uh, so our vital force has been hammered. You know what happens when you lose your vital force? You die. So what happens is Adventism has got this thing. They're like a blind man. He's had a lung, a kidney removed, his spleen been removed, the gallbladder's removed, the appendix and the reproductive organs are removed, but he looks fine to all appearances, and he even tells you that it's the case. Everything is good. Well, it's the church militant. Have anybody ever heard about the church militant? Well, I heard I'm the church militant. I came into Adventism 60 years ago. I went to everything that Adventism produced as a child. I went to all the MB programs. We had morning and evening worship. I went to Vespers. I went to all the Revelation seminars. I went through all the schooling. Do you think I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist? Huh. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Do you think I knew what my message was? I heard the Three Angels' message all the time. All the time. Only I never heard it. Only I never heard the Three Angels' messages. How's that possible? Well, because Satan had done this little thing. He crucified the message. He was able to do it. I'm going to read you two things, two accounts. And this is in Spiritual Gifts. Pay close attention to the dates. Page 74. Interesting, it's on the same page as this other in early writings. So, Spiritual Gifts, page 74. Listen to this. But at this time, Thomas was not present. He would not humbly receive the report of the disciples, but firmly and self-confidently affirmed that he would not believe unless he should, he should put his finger in the prints of the nails and his hand in the side where the cruel spear was thrust. In this he showed a lack of confidence in his brethren, and if all should require the same evidence, but few would receive Jesus and believe in his resurrection. But it was the will of God that the report of the disciples should go from one to the other. And many receive it from the lips of those who had seen and heard. God was not well pleased with such unbelief. And when Jesus met with his disciples again, Thomas was with them. The moment he beheld Jesus, he believed. But, 
had declared that he would not be satisfied without the evidence of feeling added to sight. And Jesus gave him the evidence that he desired. Thomas cried out, My Lord and my God! But Jesus reproved Thomas for his unbelief. He said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So I saw. Now listen, this is really important. And I know that some of you have read this and heard this before. So I saw that those who had no experience in the first and second angels' messages must receive them from those who had an experience and followed down through the messages. Who are you going to receive your experience from? The pioneers. Nobody in this age has gone through that experience. Not one. None of us have. The Lord is trying to get us there, but we have not. So it says, listen to this and followed down through the message. I saw Jesus was crucified. I saw Jesus was crucified, so I saw that these messages have been crucified. Tell, this is 1858 that this is being written. What is crucifixion? Death. What kind of death? Nasty. Slow, painful. Who is it slow and painful to? Well, the one being crucified for sure. But those who are part of that message, the disciples or whatever, who are observing and they're, they're, they're part of this message is being crucified, right? And so the, the messages have been crucified. And as the disciples declared that there was salvation in no other name under heaven given among men, so also should the servants of God faithfully and fearlessly declare that those who embrace but a part of the truths, this guy right here, this apart, this is the third angel's message, right? If we've heard it, of course, we must be proclaiming it, right? No, 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 no. Yeah. No. But a part of the truth with the third message must gladly embrace the first and second and third message as God has given them or have no part nor lot in the matter. No part. Embrace them the way God gave them or get out of the house. Okay, now listen. This is 1882. And page 188. Early writings. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, everything that I just read about Thomas and the thing that was going on is exactly the same in this book. But listen to what happens. So, in like manner, those who have had no experience in the first and second angel's messages must receive them from others who had an experience and followed down through the messages. As Jesus was rejected, so I saw that these messages have been rejected. What just happened? They're not crucified here, are they? They're not crucified. So what happened? The messages came back. Ellen White gave the message over and over again. It's the messages of to the Laodiceans. It's a message of the true witness. Buy of me gold, tried in the fire, first angel. White raiment, second angel, the righteousness of Christ. Judgment to come, third angel, Isab. So what has happened here? This is 1882 and she's saying the message got crucified. It was obliterated. Now it's come back to us. It's come back to us. And what do we get to do? We get to reject it. He's rejected because what happened after his resurrection? What happened after his resurrection? He came back to his people for 40 days. He's in the city. He's going from place to place. Is he accepted or rejected? He's rejected. So the message comes. You have an opportunity. Do you accept? Do you reject? But it only comes in one way, the way God has given it. 
The three angels. Now, I'm going to... Maybe getting ahead of myself here. Okay. Manuscript release, volume 21, page 436 and 437. This is the gospel of love. Listen. The gospel of Christ is full of love, rich in assurance and comfort. Every soul needs now to understand the foundation of his faith. Do you understand this foundation? This is the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the truth that written on the heart will get you through the issue that's coming. How do I know that? I'll finish that quote in a second. Blair Writings, 256. Many who embrace the third message, that would be me or any of us who are ever Seventh-day Adventists from our youth. I embrace the third angel's message, what I knew of it. Many who embrace the third message had not an experience in the two former messages. Satan understood this. He's known all along that we haven't had the experience. Satan understood this, his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them, but the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. And those who had had an experience in the past messages were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary. So our intellect tells us we know all about what's going on in heaven. We can get in the most holy place. My brain tells me it's so. Isn't that right? But what didn't happen? It says the first two angels are pointing us how to get to the sanctuary in the first place. To the most holy place. Into the understanding of the seventh day Sabbath. Correctly understood in the ark. The way they got to it. Okay, listen. The past messages were pointed. You know what? I'm going to stop here for just a second. I, I don't want to put anybody on the edge because I get amped out with this information. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's so much to, that, that I want to share. This is, this is the heart issue. The Lord has done this thing with me, and he's showed me such truths that just are mind-bending to me. And it's like, I want them to transfer, but I realize it's not my business to transfer that information. Only my Heavenly Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit, can transfer the information. So my thing is to get excited. Unfortunately, it just always happens. And my wife tells me, ease up, Blaine. You're in AFib all the time anyway. You're going to die. <laughs> it's true. I've been in AFib for two years, solid. My heart never beats a normal heartbeat, ever. does not. It's a scary thing. If you listen to it now, you'd send me to the hospital. Anyway, it says, many, it's, listen, and those who had had an experience in the past messages were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary. These pioneers, the dead who are speaking to us, are telling us how it is we get there by the messages. Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages. Bunk, whoosh, they saw the perfect chain of truth, okay? And gladly received them in their order. <laughs> in their order. None of these get changed. God says, don't change them. Amen. There has he wants them. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to go with the angel Gabriel on this. Amen. I'm going to go, and then I'm going to try and find out. Because the question, you have to have the right question, has to be put there by the Holy Spirit. The question is, Lord, how is it that this thing has anything to do with me being like you? <laughs> right question. I need the character of Christ. There's something in this message, and we'll get to that in a minute. Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angel's message and gladly received them in the order and followed Jesus by faith into the heavenly sanctuary. When the, when the thing happens, you know what? Everybody says, well, we're in the second angel. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're getting the first angel. We're in the second angel. You know, and pretty soon the third. No, 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 we're not. The Lord's still trying to instill this. He's still trying to get the first angel through our thick skulls. It's called justification. Laying your glory in the dust. Doing for you what Christ doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. 
first angel, ripping self out of there, replacing it with the work of the Holy Spirit, telling you how and what to do and when to do it and why to do it. And we're in there rooting around, not letting the Lord do His work. And so we think that we've passed into the courtyard. Really. Think about those people who have passed into the courtyard with their lambs. Find out what was going on in their head when it was happening. Oh man, serious business. That's before it got all polluted and twisted and couldn't do what it was supposed to do anymore. In the beginning. Man, this was so serious. It was very exact in the asking forgiveness, placing it on the head of the lamb. There was an understanding of what was going on there. It wasn't the confessional, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness. No, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you, this is what we do. We've got the Adventist confessional. We use a scripture to do it. This is an article, Ju July 20th, 1905. All of these things that are here, they're for you to have and take. Study them if you take them. Give them away. Do whatever you want to do. I'm going to use a bit and piece of each one of these things so you get a little idea of what's happening here with the truth that the Lord's made plain. Give them pamphlets. Give them information. So years ago, the Lord gave me this. Sherry found it again for me and said, you remember this article? Yeah, actually. So I've been printing them. The sins of God's people can never be born from the heavenly sanctuary and placed back upon the anti-typical scapegoat so long as sins are going into the sanctuary. In other words, so long as sinning and repenting is continued, therefore until the great threefold message becomes an experience in the life of every believer of the everlasting power of God to save from sin and from sinning, this work can never be closed up. Christ cannot quit. He can't stop and come because we don't get it. We have to ask for something. We have to see it clearly what it is and ask that it will happen. What do you think they were praying that they would enter into the sufferings of Christ for back in the day? Man, we don't know how to suffer. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be hungry. I don't want to be wet. I don't want to be miserable in any way. I don't want to give up anything. That's me. I know none of you have that problem. So it's, it's, you know, it's just... So, the rest of this quote from manuscript releases. In simple language and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, oh, the gospel of Christ is full of love, rich in assurance and comfort. Every soul needs now to understand the foundation of his faith. In simple language and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, present the truth. We have the word, that wonderful book, which contains the very instruction needed at this time. The testing time is right upon us. We must build upon the rock, Christ. That will stand the storm of test and trial. Which rock are you building on? Are you going to pass the test? Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages and gladly received them in their order and followed Jesus by faith in the heavenly sanctuary. These messages were represented to me as an anchor. As an anchor to the people of God. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from the being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. You know what? I'm, no, I'm not a contestant for Satan. He just messes with me. He takes me out at every possible angle he does. So do I want a foundation to stand on that I can put my faith and trust in? Do I want Christ, the hope of glory, in my heart by a message that he's given to make it so? Oh yeah, because you're going to have to stand on it shortly. We're just about to enter a time that none of us are ready for. And our experience is not what it should be. We're busy, busy battling each other and having all kinds of issues and nobody's coming together on anything. And you know what? That's because it's the end of time. 
Because we can't, we can't, self won't let it, won't let it happen. It will not let it happen. I just, just, yeah, people just are on my grind, you just like, I don't even, you know, I don't want to be around you, you're a miserable thing. Think about it. Well, look at her attitude. Man, he's just, we do it. We can't be trust. the Lord can't trust us with his word. We're supposed to be vessels, righteous, empty, wholly used by him. When we got these attitudes and these words and these things, I'm talking about me. So the Lord's dealing with me. He's taking care of my issues and he's putting me in the situation that I need to be in to get it taken care of. So it says, this testing time is right upon us. We must build upon the rock that will stand the storm of test and trial. As we see the fulfillment of prophecy, we know the end of all things is at hand. Present and eternal principles of truth. Hmm. Show what the, I was going to go into principles, I'm not going to do that. Show what the word of God declares is to take, show what the word of God declares is to take place on this earth. The God who gave Daniel instruction regarding the closing scenes of this earth's, his, this earth's history will certainly confirm the testimony of his servants as at the appointed time they gave the loud cry. All the messages given from 1840 to 44 are to be made forcible now, for there are many who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. We're going to get to that interesting information. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see. Now I'm going to cry. The prophets wanted to see the stuff. What we're seeing and hearing right now, they wanted to see. And we get to see it. It's a powerful blessing like we have. Eternity will only tell. So it says... That many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Matthew 13, 16, and 17. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 44. Blessed are your eyes. You're seeing a taste of what was seen in the message that's being presented just now. The message was given. There were, should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. How's he going to give his testimony? Ah, the work that he gave and gave us in the scripture has to be written on your heart and understood in your life. So he can do such a thing. Okay. We know from Selected Messages, page 338, that never are we absent from the mind of God. God is our joy and our salvation. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Okay. Keep that in mind. We're going to step on some toes here in a minute. Mine have been smashed. My toenails are messed up because of it. You know, the Lord just stepping on my toes, and so I'm going to share that. Now all these things happen for them for examples, examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We're at the end of the world. So the thing has come. So we're told in early writings... Page 229. I'm going to go into the first angel's message just a little bit. Because this first angel's message that was given by Father Miller to us has a profound implication in whether or not we'll ever meet our Savior. Page 229, and this is a really familiar quote. God sent his angel, that would be Gabriel. That is the one who took 
Lucifer's position, who is now Satan. Gabriel took that position. He handles all the prophetic understanding through time. Him and Michael work together. It says, God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one. This person is chosen for a very specific reason. And you're going to see what it is here in a second. To guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies that had ever been dark to God's people. Okay, listen to what happens here. The commencement of truth was given to him. What's the beginning of the chain of truth here? What's the beginning of the chain of truth here? 677. Now, I don't care what anybody else tells you. God is telling you that this is where it starts. You can argue with it. I can do whatever I want with it, but it ain't going to change what it is. And what we've been told by God's Spirit through Ellen White, what it is. And I'm going to share something with you that is profound that each of us have a problem with. And even though I understand and know this information, I still have a problem with it. I just is the way I am. It was the way I was raised. And so it's ever interfering. So it's just like the disciples. When Christ was given the truth of his Father in heaven, all of the stuff that they learned from the rabbis kept intercepting the information and they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. The understanding of prophecy had ever been dark to other people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given him, and he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. He saw a perfect chain. He was given the chain so that we can see it. And we're told that no pins, no pegs, no links, no nothing can be pulled out. So in the early days, after 1844 and confusion began to come in, guess which pin got pulled? The daily. So what happens? You disintegrate the two desolating powers. You take them apart. You don't have a 2520 more. You only have half a prophecy. You only have half a prophecy. You don't got the rest of it. Paganism. So, this is the commencement of the chain of truth. How did, how did William Miller study his Bible? One end or the other. Okay. So we discovered that Miller goes text by text by text until he doesn't get it. And, and he doesn't understand what's going on. So then he goes into God's Word. He uses line upon line, precept upon precept. He begins to use God's Word to understand where he is. So what did we just find out was the commencement of the chain of truth? 677. Why do you think that, that he would do that? Because Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wants to bring himself to us. It has to be the first thing we get. We have to get Christ first and last and best in everything. And so Miller, when he gets to Leviticus 26, you know, you know the one, you've heard about it. When he gets to Leviticus 26, he runs into an issue. The angel Gabriel. You think he did? The angel Gabriel says, listen, and he's standing there, I'm pretty sure, because he's given the instruction, feeding information to Miller in his study, in his understanding. And Miller sees something. He sees something. He sees Manasseh and his people. And he sees they're not obeying. They're the church militant. Right? Mm -hmm. And so he sees he needs to do something with them. He needs to lay their glory in the dust. Their pride. And there are other issues that are going on. So where do they go? In the captivity. What happens to Manasseh? He gets it. Only through the process. 
So who do you see first? Christ comes because at the end of time, the Lord shows the end by the beginning. You're going to have to see Jesus or you will never understand what this is. Now let me tell you what he says. Some of you have read the lecture. I've got copies of it here. Some of you have read this lecture. Let me, I read this lecture dozens of times. But about the ninth or tenth time I read it, the Lord said, am I going to have you share this at a camp meeting? I'm like, Lord, I don't, I'm not Miller. I only know a couple things about this lecture. Yeah, I know. I want you to read it again. I'm like, what? I'm going to read it again. How many times do I got to read the thing? Read it. So I pick it up. And I read this. The very first sentence, I believe Gabriel is penning through Miller. We are in the habit. And by the way, I looked up in the dictionary what a habit is. It is a concrete practice. In other words, you can't vary from it. You will do this. You can, tell, you can say, I'm nuts. I don't care. God's program, he's the one who wrote it. We are in the habit of reading the judgments and threatenings in the Word of God as denunciations against some other people but ourselves. The Lord says, stop. I'm not going to read anything. You're not getting this, Blaine. I wrote this lecture for you. What? Yeah, I'm interested in saving you. I worry about you first, and then you, you, know, you can maybe help somebody else, but you need to get this. You're in the habit of doing this thing. Everything you read, blessing or curse, you're giving it to somebody else. Mostly it's the denunciation, the threatenings. They're for somebody else. We're, we're the Seventh-day Adventists. Obviously, we go tell them Catholics. They got a problem, right? Obviously, the problems for them, they're going to burn in hell because they aren't keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm in the habit of reading the judgments of God and giving them to somebody else, placing them on somebody else. I'm not taking the understanding of what's going on here and put it in my own heart. So, some of us understand, if we look closely at the thing, we will understand that, where is Christ in this message? Wait a minute, we learned that He became sin for us, right? He took what was our issue and He took it on Himself. He literally, He did this thing. We don't understand it, we never will completely, but hopefully enough to break our hearts. So, this, listen, because this is us. This is Desire of Ages, chapter 11, um, page 112. Says, he knew that, this is John the Baptist, he knew that it was the world's Redeemer whom he had baptized. The Holy Spirit rested upon him with outstretched hand. He pointed to Jesus and he cried, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He had the token, the dove. He saw. He knew what the token was. He made the statement. He made the statement. How many of us have made statements about the 2520? We've made some statements, right? Do we recognize who it is we're making a statement about? Listen, none among the hearers, not even the speaker himself, that would be me. That would be John the Baptist. But we're supposed to be John the Baptist. Given the second return of Christ, the message, we're supposed to be as John the Baptist. He represents us. So it says, not even the speaker discerned the import of these words, the Lamb of God. Okay, well, how did they miss that? How did they miss the Lamb of God? Their whole system was based on killing lambs for their sins and that he was supposed to be that representation, right? Isn't that the truth? That is the truth, as, as I know it and understand it. It says, 
So listen to what happens. It says, upon, upon Mount Moriah, if she jumped, that's what she jumps right into. Behold the Lamb of God. And then she jumps into this because they didn't get it. The people didn't get it. They didn't get it. We don't get it either. We said, sure we do. You say, the Lamb of God, I know what that is. But when you say, behold the 2520 that takes away the sin of the world, what kind of reaction are you going to get from that? Somebody's going to crucify you. Listen, Abraham had heard the question of his own, my father, of his son, my father. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The father answered, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Genesis 22, 7 and 8. And in the ram divinely provided, in the place of Isaac, Abraham saw a symbol of him who was to die for the sins of man. What did he see? He saw the new covenant. He saw Christ written in your heart. Abraham had Christ written in his heart. The old covenant went away. He was now serving by an understanding of who his Savior was. For real. He saw. They didn't see. They, the tim symbols and types were toads. They didn't have them anymore. They'd forgotten. They, so when he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and they should have went, Wait a minute. This morning we had a sacrifice to represent the Lamb of God for our sins. And, and this afternoon we had a sacrifice. And, and uh uh, it says that he's going to be cut off in the middle of the week. That's 1260 days from now. He's going to be, he's going to die. And, and if we, if, if we keep doing this by the time it gets there, he will be the 2520th lamb that is slain. Oh, there's something more important happening here because we're the one that's supposed to help finish this project. There's a lamb that escapes in case we miss the loose end. Which lamb is that? The 2520th lamb. What did the curse do? Saved us from. What did it save him from? Who was going to... A system that now was militant. What happened? Somebody's going to escape. To be the 144,000. Somebody are going to be like Christ. It's going to bring down all that the devil and his hordes can wreak havoc on you. That's the test. Do I accept? So where is Christ? Well, he's with his people in captivity. Huh. So it says, Abraham saw a symbol of him who was to die for the sins of man. The Holy Spirit through Isaiah Taking up the illustration prophesied of the Savior, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. We don't get any different treatment. You got a particular cup. You don't get any different treatment. Same thing happens. Satan hates you. He's going to drub you out. You better know who you stand with. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, 7 and 6, but the people of Israel had not understood the lesson, many of them regarded the sacrificial offerings much as the heathen looked upon their sacrifices as gifts by which they themselves might propitiate the deity. And that's appeasing, by the way. So what are we doing? When you sin and you know you're messed up, do you grind up a, oh, Lord, I'm just really, really sorry this time. Or I get... What do you do? I'm going to read some, 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 some things from this really quickly and then I'm done. And I'll let, so, I'm, so I set in place some of the things that we should know, the verification of these truths that are in print, Christ, just as His Word is in print. I was the Word made flesh. So Christ gave us these as a wall of protection. He gave us as a foundation. He gave us for something to walk with Him, learn of Him. Daniel and Revelation. When you understand these books, you'll have a completely new and different experience. This is A.T. Robinson. I may be related to the guy. I don't know. 
This guy, he came into Adventism about 1870. This is the Review and Herald, July 20th, 1905. The most profound. I've read thousands of articles, literally. Information such as, uh, there's not, like Miller said, the half wasn't told me. What an amazing picture of Christ you get when you start reading the testimonies and you start reading these, this information we've been given to reveal Christ to us. Listen to this. No man can give to another what he does not himself possess. Therefore, the only one who can give this message is the one who can do so in a testimony backed up by an experience in the life of all that is in the message itself. I'm trying to give you a hint of what's in the message. Christ is in the message. That's where he is. Anything short of this falls short of giving the third angel's message. There may be the correct form of the message. It may be given in such clear lines as to convince multitudes of, it, multitudes of its truthfulness, but the only one who can give that heaven-sent message with the authority that is backed of the message is the one whose testimony is backed up by an experience in his own life of all that is in the message. Let us see if we do not find this in the message itself. So the message, of course, we're talking about is Revelation 14. The whole thing, but of course we go to 6 to 13 as the three angels because that's where it's stated. And I might go there because most of us understand that and know that. So in the very words of the message, and I saw another angel in the mid, flying in the, fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. How many of you have heard lots of gospels? Well, I have the gospel. I have the love gospel. I just love God. I just, you know, I know how to do that. I can hug you and I can change your flat tire. I, I can just love you dearly. No, you can't. That's only human stuff. If Christ doesn't do this thing, we hate each other and we'll just kill each other. That's what we do. We don't know how to do anything different, but we think, I know what the love is. I know how it's supposed to look. It doesn't look anything like what you think it looks like. It doesn't. It does not. It's like when the Lord goes to reveal some character issue, some trait that you have because you asked that he would do this thing in you and all of a sudden this issue comes up and you're like, where'd that come from? Man, I'm going to get out of the way of this thing. I'm being reproved by my own sin here. This is not good. Oh, that's not good. Well, it must not be my problem. Somebody else has got the problem. I'm going to avoid it. No, you need to get taken care of. Ah, the people symbolized by these three angels have something. What is this which they have? Having the everlasting gospel. What do they have the everlasting gospel for? Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. That's the point. They must first have the message. It must be an experience in the life before they can preach it to others. The testimony of the great apostle is right to the point. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, Galatians 1, 15 and 16. He might have preached about Jesus. He might have shown the time and place and manner of his coming so clearly as to convince all who listened to him that every specification of the prophecy had been fully met. But to preach him fully, to preach Jesus, he who is the power of God and the wisdom of God must be fully revealed in his own life. In order to give this message with a loud voice, which is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord, like him who was the herald of his first advent, one must be the message himself. So I pray, Lord. I did before I'm here. I'm like, Lord, I need... May come be the message because you said I have to be. And I'm, uh, with everything I have, I'm, I'm wanting to live this life so that I can be. You know what? I can't say I'm perfect. I can't do it. It's not so. I got issues. The Lord's dealing with them. The gospel being the power of God unto salvation from sin and the third angel's message being the everlasting gospel. What less than the everlasting power of God to save from sin can this message be? That's all it is. Ever the Lord is dealing with our sin issue. 
How can any man give such a message as that, backed up by the authority which belongs to the message, unless he can present in his own life the evidence that there is power in the message to accomplish that thing? You will never, ever get a message that will deal with your sin in the structure of Adventism today. That's a brash statement, but it's a fact. And I'm 60 years of it, I know that it's so. I know that it's so. The only message that will deal with your sin is this one where you start with the commencement of the chain of truth. Lord, help me. Help us all, we perish. We have not a message if you have not done this thing in me. I need to be a lamb that escapes here. I need to escape a system that cannot save you. They want to save you in your sin. Or the Lord took care of all of it at the cross. Or some crazy thing that evangelicals do and whatever. It's nutty stuff. But we convince ourselves of that because we don't know what the cure is. We don't know how to get it fixed. The Lord gave us the cure. So it says, the sins of God's people can never be born from the heavenly sanctuary. And I read that to you. I think earlier, the scapegoat and take it back. Therefore, until this great threefold message becomes an experience in the life of every believer of the everlasting power of God to save from sin and from sinning, this work can never be closed up. The cleansing of the soul temple must be an accomplished fact before the sanctuary in heaven can be cleansed. Man, we've got to quit holding up the program. I have to stop. I want the Lord to come back. I'm really sick and tired of this junk that's going on in this planet. And guess what? There's not a, most of the religions or the, most of the gospel things that are taught out there, take some little goody thing that you got, look down inside there, and then the Lord will just develop it into this wonderful thing. You know, we're told we got a measure of faith. We do got a measure of faith. That's not some good thing in us. That was given by God that we might see him and understand him and live his life. The path that he walked from the baptism to the crucifixion is only an example of the path that we walk. It's only an example. He didn't walk that path that we didn't have to walk it. He showed us what it looks like. He showed it what it looks like when all of hell is on your case to make sure you don't get there. And he took us, this curse that is upon us. Christ, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13. The curse of the law was slavery to sin or an inability to render obedience to the law. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3.10 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Disobedience. It's the point that the blessing of Abraham, obedience or righteousness by faith, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, and we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.13 and 14 Sin being the transgression of God's law, Deliverance from sin is freedom to keep the law. Hence, those who experience the third angel's message, the everlasting power of God to save from disobedience. Two classes are being developed under the sounding of this message. You're hearing it. Upon one class is being stamped the mark of the beast and his image. You realize, of course, we all have the mark of the beast it just didn't get tested at this point to show that that's exactly what we have. So the Lord is trying to save us from that, to put us through this experience that will keep us in that time of trouble such as never was. This test, this Sunday law that comes that is going to obliterate most of what we see of Adventism. Probably most of present truth, as we're told. The image and superscription of this world is being placed upon them. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and there declared their sin is as Sodom. They hide it not, Isaiah 3, 9. The other class is being sealed with the seal of the living God. Oh, Lord, I pray that it would be so just now. 
They have the Father's name written in their foreheads, Revelation 7, 1 to 4 and 14, 1. The image and superscription of God instead of that of the beast is being placed upon them. Transformations of character are taking place, which cause the holy angels to look on with amazement and the evil angels to stand aghast. And like, how can, how can that? It's happening because Christ said it would happen to those who make that decision. Lord, take, I'm gonna take my will from Satan. He's got it. He's using me to do whatever he wants to do. I want you to have it and make my choices yours or your choice is mine. And you get that fouled up. Okay, now there's something happened here. We just kept Sabbath and we're now in the new week looking forward to another Sabbath. There remaineth therefore a rest, keeping of a Sabbath, to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his, Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. Our own works are sin. An interesting statement. Our own works are sin. Once more then, the conclusion is reached that the realization of the third angel's message as an experience in the life is the everlasting power of God to deliver us from the dominion of sin. And having created, and having ceased from our work, sin, we can enter into spiritual rest of soul, which is the only true Sabbath keeping. I haven't kept a true Sabbath in my life. Think about it. When this kind of Sabbath keeping is an experience in the life, we can then go forth and preach the Sabbath more fully. That's when Satan is upset. That's when he comes unglued. When he sees that I can't stop them from getting the character of Christ. Now, I covered the past. And I went longer than I ever thought I was going to, of course, and everybody knows I do that. So, <clears throat> but I want Kenny now to show where we are. This is really something that you need to hear. This is something the Lord just recently has shared with us. And we're agonizing. We're getting beat up. We're losing a battle, it seems. On every side, we're getting hammered. But in this thing, the Lord is giving truth. 